last talk uh, before our, our panel and, and continuing the theme of how, how the endocrine system uh, interacts with our nervous system. Uh, Stephanie Se Seminar will uh, speak from Mass General. She's professor there uh, and uh, um, comes from the reproductive endocrine unit working on hypogonadism. And, and uh, she and I started to talk and just discover that a lot of the genes she was looking at from a hypogonadism point of view actually had a large impact upon uh, myelination, myelin development. And so here's another synergy. So thanks so much. Thank you all, uh, Florian. Thank you so much for inviting me. I have to say I'm delighted that we're ending on so many endocrine notes. It's really, really quite uh, wonderful. OK, so by the end of the talk today, um, I hope to really convert you all to reproductive endocrinology. OK, so our goals for today are to talk about the disease models that connect neurology with reproductive disorders. We're going to discuss a family of rare reproductive uh, and neurologic conditions. We're going to have some treatment considerations, and then what are current research directions. So this is a patient that was seen several decades ago at Mass General Hospital uh, by Fuller Albright, who's really one of the fathers of endocrinology in the 20th century. And this patient presented, he's a young adult male. He had cryptorchidism with undescended testes, a small phallus. He was under-virilized because he hadn't undergone any pubertal development, and he had no sense of smell. And this patient was ultimately found to have a condition called hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. So let's review what the reproductive axis is and why it's relevant to our discussions this morning. In the hypothalamus, a hormone named GnRH is stimulated in a pulsatile fashion. And it stimulates the pituitary gland to release the gonadotropins, LH and FSH. And these go on to stimulate the gonads for gametogenesis, making eggs and sperm, and sex steroid production, testosterone and estradiol. When we have a problem intrinsically at the level of the gonad, okay, as shown here, then we have elevated pituitary secretion. We're stimulating that gonad to try to perform its work, but the gonad has an intrinsic incapability of performing. And so in a condition like ALD, where we have testicular atrophy, there may be a primary defect here, such that the gonadotropin levels are high. Our laboratory thinks about reproductive conditions in which we know the problem is here, in the higher brain centers that control reproduction, so that if we don't have GnRH stimulation or pituitary stimulation, we can't stimulate the gonads to do their job. Intrinsically, the problem from a pathomechanistic point of view is not here at the gonad. The pathomechanism is here, either in the hypothalamus or the pituitary, and that was relevant to the patient that we saw in the earlier slide. So these patients with hypogonadotropic hypogonadism represent a rare disease model that our unit investigates from a genetic and then from a translational point of view. And obviously, the reason that we study this model is not just so that we can understand patients with this disorder, but that we can understand a spectrum of reproductive disorders that we see commonly in our clinics. So that spectrum would include, for example, here, children with late puberty, but who undergo normal sexual maturation by the age of eight, age 18, or women here with hypothalamic amenorrhea, excessive exercise, uh, decreased caloric intake, uh, high levels of stress in which we have a decrease in body weight and we have an acquired form of hypogonadotropic hypogonadism and loss of menstrual function. So there's a spectrum of very common disorders that we think if we understand the genetics of this rare model can inform. Today, we're going to be going into the ultra-rare disease model, however, so taking patients with an even more rare subphenotype of this hypogonadotropic state and patients who have not only this reproductive condition but also ataxia and other neurologic elements, again pointing to a central brain dysfunction. So we're here at the intersection of two fields, neurology and reproduction. So part of this disease model is 100 years old. 
It was described by a physician in the early 1900s, a very prominent neurologist, Dr. Gordon Holmes, who described a small cohort of patients who presented to his clinic with ataxia. And on post-mortem examination of one of these uh, individuals, when they were looking at the cerebellum, they saw that the brain was not only small, but the cerebellum was really fibrosed and sclerosed, and there was a particular effect on the Purkinje cells in the cerebellum. There were really no Purkinje cells left to be found. And he was the first to describe that these individuals also have had evidence for hypogonadism, small phallus and small testicular size. So he was the first to establish this link. Well, case reports of this condition, which was named after Dr. Holmes, appeared in the literature. But about 10 or 15 years ago, a neurologist here at Mass General introduced our laboratory group to this pedigree from the Middle East in which there were three siblings that appeared to have similar components of this disorder, dysarthria, ataxia, and hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, a brain-originating disorder. And we actually sent the neurologist to the Middle East where this family resided to better understand the physiology affecting the reproductive cascade, and we published this work and attracted more patients to our unit so that we could perform continued studies. And we're going to come back to what some of this reproductive work revealed in a moment. So here we are with a condition, a neurodegenerative condition, affecting uh, the reproductive and neurologic systems. And after many, many years of stalled efforts in trying to get at the genetics of this disorder, two years ago we were able to make a breakthrough using whole um, exomic sequencing. And we found mutations in a few genes, multiple genes, in that family from the Middle East. The first mutation that we identified was an E3 ubiquitin ligase called RNF216. So this protein attaches a ubiquitin tag to proteins and marks them for degradation in the cell. The second protein is OTUD4. This is a de-ubiquitinase. So it allows for the recycling of target proteins and for ubiquitin itself and often functions in partnership with an E3 ligase. So here you have a family with this ultra rare disorder and putative mutations in two genes that are both pointing to ubiquitination as a key pathway. So why would this be relevant? Well, there already are established links for ubiquitin in uh, many neurologic diseases. In the autosomal um, recessive form of Parkinson's, there are mutations in an E3 ligase. Um, in Angelman syndrome, which is a mental retardation disorder, there are mutations in an E3 ligase. Um, and in other forms of dementia, there are mutations that lead to, uh, not mutations in, in ligases per se, but there is histopathology with ubiquitin inclusions that parallels what we saw in the brain of some of um, our patients. So let's go back to our family. As you can see here, here are our affected individuals. They're all carrying homozygous mutations in RNF216. No one else in the family is homozygous for that gene. And then in yellow, here are the mutations for our de-ubiquitinase. Again, no one else in the family is homozygous for a mutation in that gene. So only the affected have mutations in both. They're both in play as causal for this disease. And indeed, when we went back to our freezer and looked at other probands who had come to our unit for research studies, we found a number of other individuals with this disorder in which we had mutations in RNF216. So we are now elevating our data, our causality data, for this gene playing a role in the disorder. We turned to one of our collaborators who works at the Genetic Modeling Center at Duke to understand how these genes might be creating a phenotype in our patients. And when you knock down these genes, you saw three things in zebrafish, small eyes, small optic tecta, which is a paralog to the forebrain in humans, and disorganization of the cerebellum. So here you can see the beautiful layering of the cerebellum in a normal zebrafish embryo. Here, when you knock down these genes, you see almost a smushed, uh, disorganized cerebellum. And then when you add back normal copies of these genes, you um, restore that normal patterning of the cerebellar layering. So 
Here we are with a condition named after the person to first describe it, notable for phenotypes of ataxia, the reproductive condition, hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. But there are other conditions that are quite comparable to Gordon Holmes. One of them is the 4-H syndrome, a known leukodystrophy that again presents with ataxia, reproductive failure, and interestingly, tooth anomalies. So there's hypodontia. Patients often um, don't get in their full upper complement of upper and lower teeth. And what clue that's giving us, we're still working to understand. There are also patients with another neurodegenerative disorder, Boucher-Neuhauser syndrome. Again, ataxia, hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, and chorioretinal dystrophy. So there are, like many layers of an onion, these concentric circles of closely related phenotypic rare diseases that are giving us very important clues. And indeed, the last 24 months have given us an explosion in the genetic understanding of all of these conditions. So here we were, starting with Gordon Holmes, we published in the New England Journal two years ago the mutations in our ubiquitin-related genes and collaborated with a group in China to put another E3 ligase on the map. Concomitantly, multiple mutations were identified in uh, patients with the 4-H syndrome, and these genes encode subunits of RNA polymerase 3. For Boucher-Neuhauser syndrome, very recently, the identification of mutations in a lysophospholipase, PNPLA6. So really, simultaneously, as a community, we've come to a much greater genetic understanding of all of these neurodegenerative disorders. And when I try to take a step back and look at this biology, I'm always trying to create what are the dots connecting these clues. So for example, when I think about Gordon Holmes, where we started, here we have uh, defects in genes that um, uh, affect ubiquitination. Well, what are those uh, proteins ubiquitinating? What are their targets? One of their targets is a gene called ARC, which mediates um, neuronal plasticity and synaptic function, as also we suspect PNPLA6 does. It maintains membrane trafficking and affects exocytosis. For the um, 4-H syndrome, this leukodystrophy, as I said, we have mutations in genes that encode subunits of RNA polymerase 3. But one of our ubiquitination genes, STUB1, targets DNA polymerase beta. And so while these may be global processes, ubiquitination and RNA or DNA polymerization, we're struggling to understand whether or not the global process is affected or are there specific targets of ubiquitination and polymerization that are preferentially affected by mutations in these genes. So, the implications of these genetic discoveries are obviously that we can attack the pathophysiology of the condition. They provide opportunities for our patients to understand their genetics, opportunities for our patients now and in the future to undergo pre-implantation genetic testing, and obviously for us as investigators to understand the genotype-phenotype correlations for these disorders. So what does that mean? Well, here we've mapped out for a cluster of patients that we've studied closely when individuals presented with reproductive symptoms and when they presented with neurologic symptoms. So here we have 12 patients, and in the blue, we have the time of onset of, of um, neurologic presentation, and in yellow, the time of onset of uh, uh, reproductive symptoms. So you can see that the slide divides itself here. The first eight patients or so all have yellow before blue meaning they first presented to their physicians with a reproductive complaint. Maybe it was loss of erectile function or amenorrhea. And all of those patients were found to carry mutations in one of our ubiquitination genes, RNF216. Contrast that pattern here with this cluster of patients, all presented first with blue, the neurologic uh, symptom, way before yellow. So these patients present really as children and have a much more slowly progressive course of their condition. And these individuals have the 4-H leukodystrophy and they all carry mutations in polar 3B. So the further we drill down and dissect the genetics, the better we can understand the individual uh, patient presentations and better inform and educate our uh, patients. <clears throat> 
So as a reproductive endocrinologist, what's always struck me about these conditions as a whole is their unique signature. You know, the anterior pituitary, and we've been discussing thyroid this morning and other endocrine centers, the anterior pituitary controls the adrenal, it controls the thyroid, prolactin, growth hormone, and reproduction. And yet for these patients, there is this unique emphasis really on the reproductive cascade. It's as if there's some signature about those neurons, some vulnerability that that particular system has to this disease process um, that's unusual. That is, again, an important clue. The challenge in reproduction, however, is that symptoms may not always be appreciated. The reproductive axis has times of great activity and also times of quiescence. And so symptoms are not always appreciated. And even if they are appreciated, they may not be perceived by providers as being part of this global syndrome. Also, medications may obscure um, symptoms. So for example, if a woman has been put on a birth control pill for unrelated reasons, that may be masking hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. That may be an important component of her, of her disease. And it's important not to miss these issues because there's marked clinical sequelae of hypogonadism, right? We know that. Um, that uh, if we don't have appropriate stimulation of the reproductive cascade, that can lead to low levels of sex hormones and difficulties with fertility. And sex hormones are critical, not only for reproductive function, but achievement of peak bone mass and maintenance of normal bone density, which are critical in patients with neurologic disease and gait abnormalities. So what are some of the treatment considerations for patients? So first of all, how do we determine if someone has hypogonadism? Occasionally, in certain patients with brain-originating causes of hypogonadism, there can be clues in neonatal life, but they're quite rare. Occasionally, patients are born with undescended testes, which is actually not all that uncommon, or small phallus. Doesn't happen commonly, but occasionally there are clues. Childhood is an appropriate time of hypogonadism. We all go through a decade where the reproductive cascade is not active. So reproductive symptoms don't occur during this window. But at the time of expected sexual maturation or puberty, that's an important time to watch whether or not the appropriate milestones of feminization and virilization occur, um, whether or not a woman has appropriate breast development and then menstrual function, and whether or not there's testicular growth um, and erectile function in a male. In the absence of those, in late adolescence or adulthood, it's actually fairly easy um, to evaluate patients with hypogonadal disorders, beginning with your physical exam, basic biochemical evaluation, and sometimes imaging. And it's also important to take into account some of the ancillary body systems that could be affected by reproductive disorders, again, such as bone density. So when treating someone with this disorder, it's important to consider whether or not fertility is desired, because that often is the decision branch point that affects how we might manage an individual. When fertility is not desired, for someone who's got hypogonadism, whether that is related to an intrinsic gonadal defect, such as we may have an ALD, or whether or not it's due to another leukodystrophy syndrome that's affecting more central centers in the brain, it's relatively simple to replace an individual in adult life with appropriate sex steroids. There's many ways to skin that cat. For women, there's many varieties of sex hormone replacement regimens that can be low-dose menopausal regimens or higher-dose contraceptives. But we have many, many options now in terms of formulation and preparation um, to provide adequate sex steroid milieu for individuals. This is also true for adolescents. It's relatively easy to induce appropriate feminization and masculinization in individuals, whether or not that always is the best thing for the future gonadal potential of that individual later on in life is something that's actively being questioned now in the reproductive endocrine community. So it's easy to replace the hormones and get an adolescent through that high school transition. That may not be the optimal therapy for maximizing future um, fertility potential. We're working on understanding that better. So 
if somebody has a leukodystrophy that creates a central defect in our brain centers, then what, what ways can we treat for fertility? Remember that if the problem is here in the brain, the gonads intrinsically are healthy. And therefore, we can stimulate the gonads with conventional fertility drugs that produce gametogenesis. And here we have an example. We've studied a family in the UK uh, with 4H disorder, and they have mutations in polar 3B. Um, this family um, is made up of two brothers, and they carry biallelic mutations in polar 3B. These mutations have been studied in vitro and found to be deleterious. And the older brother here successfully has a daughter from fertility therapy. So the gonads were able to respond appropriately to therapy, and he is now a father of about an eight-year-old girl. However, on the research side, we're very curious to understand better and in a more precise way what these reproductive defects are because we believe if we understand the pathomechanism of the reproductive defects better, that's going to better inform our neurologic understanding of these conditions, of these leukodystrophies. So remember I said that in these rare disorders, the defect is up here at the brain. We want to know exactly where does that occur. And we now have the ability to probe each of these layers of the brain, the hypothalamus and the pituitary. So if we give the hypothalamic hormone, GnRH, can we get this pituitary to respond? And if it doesn't respond, is that telling us about the site of the defect in that particular family? So remember I said we sent one of our neurology colleagues to the Middle East with a GnRH pump to study that family with that neurodegenerative disorder, Gordon Holmes. And let me share that data with you. This is Florian right here. He's a healthy male and he's pulsing away. These are the rhythms and drives we all have in our brain. The average male secretes a pulse of GnRH from the hypothalamus and then by extension a pulse of LH from the pituitary once every two hours. That's what all of you are doing this morning. We don't see it, we don't feel it, but there's a pulse. And you can see from the back of the room these very beautiful crisp excursions of LH that are stimulating the testes, again, for sperm production and normal testosterone. Here's somebody who has hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, no leukodystrophy, just a reproductive phenotype. They have no pulses. And if we give them GnRH to stimulate their pituitary gland, pituitary wakes up and is quite robust. Okay, so I'm going to give GnRH, my pituitary is fine. The pituitary is fine, that's not the site of the defect. So this person, just with a reproductive issue, has a hypothalamic problem, because when I give back the hypothalamic hormone, we're okay. Now let's look at data from a patient from that Middle Eastern family with the neurodegenerative combination, reproductive and neurologic. They have no LH pulses at baseline. They get the same GnRH via that GnRH pump, and they do not respond at all. We have data on day one, day five, and day seven of pump exposure. The pituitary does not wake up. And so this really told us that patients with this condition have an intrinsic pituitary defect. Pituitary is not well in this disorder. Okay, pituitary problem. Let's look at another patient. This person has some pulses of LH. This is a woman five years after the onset of her presentation. She has some pulses. They're not beautiful like Florian's. They're not well articulated, but they're there and we can see them. And when we put her on GnRH, she does respond. Look at her estrogens. They go from 10 to 150 over the course of a week. On ultrasound, she was making a nice dominant follicle. Again, the morphology here is not perfect. And so the data here suggests maybe the pituitary is not 100%, or maybe there is a hypothalamic defect here, and we give back the hypothalamic hormone, and she's able to get better. So this patient presents the possibility that there can be multiple levels in the brain selectively affected in these conditions. So the possibility for both. 
Right now, our group is looking at other neuropeptides specifically to interrogate the GnRH neurons. So a whole other part of our program is developing um, a translational program for peptides we've discovered through genetics and administering them back to patients through IND. So before NCATS got its name, some of the things that we were talking about this morning, the TREND program under the NCATS umbrella, before all of that existed, um, our group received awards from the NIH to develop the preclinical talks for some of these neuropeptides that we now administer on a research basis to patients, again, with a goal of dissecting the layers of the brain that are affected in the reproductive cascade so that we understand pathomechanism better. And finally, part of the research directions of our genetics work is to understand if we're looking at just the tip of an iceberg with a very rare disorder, is that giving us clues to the larger biology of more common conditions? So genetics is showing us that these changes may be more common than we've previously appreciated. We see many, many patients are in our unit who just have reproductive disease. Neurology part is fine. Here are three of them. Okay, they all have hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. Normal neurologic function when they presented. And yet they're all carrying mutations in polar 3 b the 4-H leukodystrophy. Okay, they're biallelic mutations. Some of these have been previously validated and well studied in vitro. We believe these are all deleterious. And oddly enough, one of these patients who we studied 25 years ago we put him on the GnRH pump. We're trying to stimulate that pituitary gland and bring this man to fertility. And his testosterones never went up. And why did they not go up? They didn't go up because his gonadotropins didn't go up. So we're giving him this GnRH hypothalamic hormone, and it's pounding a pituitary that simply can't respond. And at the time, 20 years ago, we didn't know, we didn't understand it. But when we pull that data off the shelf now, we appreciate He's carrying mutations in a gene that we believe are selectively affecting the pituitary. And it now makes sense when we go back and look at his clinical data why he wasn't able to respond. So the genetics is really helping to inform our understanding of the condition and would have allowed us at the time, had we known it, to have better guided this gentleman on what would have been a more appropriate medications to have him achieve a normal sex steroid milieu and appropriate fertility. So, our mutational work, our genetics work, is informing the larger umbrella of ataxias and hypogonadotropic states. And that's a big push of our unit moving forward in the next year. So just to conclude, um, these are neurologic hypogonadal syndromes, neurodegenerative syndromes that stand at the interface between neurology and reproductive biology. Our unit focuses on those that have a central or brain-based pathomechanism. Um, these are heterogeneous. Even in this ultra-rare space, there's considerable genetic heterogeneity. We can have mutations in a single gene or mutations across several genes to create a mutational load. Um, and we're working very hard to continue to identify pathways. Our goal is to really push at the reproductive side, sometimes an underappreciated component, component of these disorders, understand the sites of the defect, and hope that this leads us to the development of better therapies. So I just want to acknowledge my laboratory team, my home base, which is the reproductive endocrine unit here at Mass General, my collaborators, including neurology, Dr. Schmalman, who's chief of our ataxia unit, my collaborator at Duke, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. That was fantastic, Stephanie. What a, what a, um, what a great speaker you are. I'm, I'm, I'm really impressed. So. Um, Boy, so are we opening up the field here, huh? I, uh, I, I think I'm seeing all these connections and the th things that we never talked about in ALD. And um, let me just state something that's so obvious that we really have not talked about in ALD at all, which is that boys develop cerebral ALD between the ages of four and eight, maybe 10. But once they hit puberty, they don't develop active brain lesions, or very rarely. So there's something about the blood-brain barrier, there's something about endothelial cells. But once they hit uh, puberty, they seem to be spared from that devastating trigger. So, so I'm, I, I, I guess this is an open invitation to Stephanie to help us. 
think about some of these questions, and, and I, I love all that uh, the physiology you're showing of pituitary uh, gland function, but can we extend this to other cell types in the brain? And uh, it, what, is, uh, what is known, if at all, and I know this is you know, probably going into a lot of complicated uh, questions, but the disorders you mentioned are obviously um, what we call uh, hypomyelinating and mm -hmm. where there's a stagnation in myelin development and, and uh, there would be obvious questions to ask about uh, oligoprecursors and their, um, their uh, uh, development. But I think we are equally here interested in other cell types, endothelial cells, microglial cells, and their, uh, um, their health as it relates to sex hormones and, and, and other uh, reproductive uh, questions. So. Oi, um, that's a big question, <laughs> big question. So if I can just bite off maybe the first part of it, which was sort of a gender or sex hormone based issue, is there some protective effect that you were alluding to in boys? Um, and, and this is becoming a big issue for our lab unexpectedly. You know, these patients are so rare so we, we don't have the opportunity to study 100 or 200 individuals and look at differences in presentation or severity based on gender. But uh, our group is trying to make uh, several mouse models reflecting these genes. And we didn't have the time today to go into that data. But in one of the mouse models for RNF216, which I, I mentioned a few times during the talk, we are seeing a gender discordance um, with, oddly enough, the female gender being spared female mice being spared more than the male mice who clearly are hypogonadotropic. Now, if I carry these mice out to 12 or 18 months, maybe both genders will be affected. So there could be a time course issue. But the issue of sex steroids playing a role is, is an open question that I think we're trying and a few other groups may be trying to answer. In terms of cell specificity, cells that are affected, mm, we are really in a, a very ignorant place about the specific cells. And I am looking to collaborate um, to understand this further. We know in the brains of patients with the, um, the first disorder I talked about, that Gordon Holmes disorder, that Middle Eastern family. So those were patients with ataxia, the reproductive issue, that on histopathology, the brain was small, the cerebellum was about 50% normal size, there wasn't a available Purkinje cell even to be studied, so they were all dead. When the brain was taken from that individual for histopath studies, unfortunately the pituitary was pulled out, and so Mass General didn't receive the pituitary gland. But our, our neuropath um, colleagues identified abnormal ubiquitin inclusions in the hippocampal cells of that brain. So we believe there is some cellular marker, these ubiquitin-positive intranuclear inclusions that are present in the brains, at least of Gordon Holmes patients, that may be some marker of pathology. And really one of the reasons that we're developing our mouse models is to try to see if we can use ubiquitin inclusions and correlate the appearance of those inclusions in the mouse with the appearance of symptoms in those animals. Because we'd like to identify windows or markers well before we have the cellular destruction and, and the problems. And so how does this brain histopathology pour, uh, be a you know, portend what's coming in terms of symptoms, and is that a window where various potential therapeutic agents could be tested? So we're working on it. Please, Lex. Um, really enjoyed your presentation. Uh, a question to uh, try and link different disciplines. For those hypogonadal syndromes where the pituitary is functioning, responsive, um, can you comment on the link between the hypothalamic deficiencies and overall metabolism? And the reason I'm asking is that there are selected hypothalamic abnormalities, mm 
where hypogonadism links, reduced brain gray matter links, and time-dependent loss of hypothalamic neurons links up with the development of disease. I'm thinking about what happens in Pader-Willi syndrome, what happens in leptin receptor deficiency and leptin deficiency, where there are either ghrelin and or leptin responsive neurons that feed into a pathway that also lead to what you finally feed on in the pituitary, where your GnRH does the job. And I'm trying to find out whether it was what you have described, what connections I can make mechanistically, and hence what happens in pituitary functional individuals with regards to their metabolic appearance. Um, are they BMIs normal? Uh, um, there are, are there other overlapping uh, functional defects based on which you can put your finger on neuronal populations known in quite different uh, patient populations where, for instance, POMC neurons are a driver of disease sure. and hypogonadism. Right. So, so this is a, a major area of investigation. Everyone wants to understand the links between metabolism and reproduction. You're absolutely right that the discovery of leptin was thought to be a key bridge between sort of integrating the body's energy status and the ability, you know, to have a normal reproductive axis. I mentioned, so here we have GnRH in the hypothalamus and then the pituitary. In the last 10 years, we've learned a lot about what controls GnRH. So our lab and others around the world identified kispeptin, which I briefly mentioned, as a major stimulus of GnRH secretion. We now know that kispeptin is having a cocktail party conversation with other neuropeptides <laughs> called neurokinin B and dynorphin. So those guys and maybe others are up there in a complex regulatory loop that somehow gives the green light signal to GnRH, and that gives the green light to the pituitary, and that gives the green light to the gonads. So then people said, if KISS, NKB, and dynorphin are critical for GnRH secretion, maybe leptin is talking to KISS. Okay, so we keep just like pushing back up, you know, the staircase. And there was work done using some elegant transgenic mouse models from Carol Elias's group. I think she published it in JCI two years ago where indeed they found that, I believe, selective leptin receptor knockout on kispeptin neurons did not have an effect, and that maybe there were intermediary populations, I think, in the mammillary bodies, that may be the links of whatever leptin's information is back to the kiss GnRH pituitary cascade. So I think the circuitry, because so many of um, our colleagues in the metabolic community are trying to map that circuitry, but mapping metabolic hypothalamic circuitry to reproductive hypothalamic circuitry has still been a little tricky. Our patients in general are not obese. They do not have other um, anterior pituitary endocrinopathies in the vast majority of cases. So, so also no link between, they may not appear obese, but yes. is their lean over fat mass in any way abnormal? Uh, I don't know that we know that. I don't know that that level of body composition has been studied. So there's a clear phenotype in the ABCD1 knockout mouse that we also have not really put our head around well, which is obesity. Hmm. And the mice get fat reliably across different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we have really put our head around why that happens. I don't know, Stefan, if anybody else here knows that. I, I, we've been trying to think and understand this. So another place where you could help us. <laughs> Thank you so much for the talk. Like, it's amazing to be walk through such a complex system, trying to integrate things that are so also novel and keep me on track. <laughs> it was very, very nice. I have um, a, a question. How much uh, it's understood of the regulation of the interaction between the myeloid niche systemically and the myeloid niche in the brain, microglia, let's call it, uh, in terms of hormonal regulation. Because we have in disease, in, in multiple sclerosis, for example, pregnancy is protective. Mm. Uh, mm. And yeah, it's very bad to get pregnant, but if you got pregnant, then you're protected for that nine month period. And postpartum is terrible, basically. And uh, mm. this is understood, and it's one disease where you get a myeloid niche from the outside coming to the inside and chewing your myelin. Um, any any understanding on this? 
The short answer is no. I think you're raising, uh, again, a, a fabulous example of a, a potentially a theme of a gender-based issue, a sex steroid-based issue that influences autoimmune pathways that then influences the symptoms of uh, a devastating neurologic condition. And in fact, we're, we're trying to actually make a collection of investigators at MGH that might be interested in really targeting some of these gender-based issues or sex steroid-based issues. We really do not have an understanding on the myelin system, either centrally or peripherally, um, how that may be affected in different sex steroid states. I would imagine for the 4-H leukodystrophy, um, where there's maybe been more peripheral myelin studies, there may be a better foundation for that data. But for the other um, disorders, Gordon Holmes, Boucher Neuhauser, I, I really don't think we have any understanding at all. Thank you. And a follow-up, and maybe it's a question for the ALD. Do we have the blue-yellow chart for all the G mutations that we have published? <laughs> The basically phenotype, endocrine phenotype, our, our adrenal insufficiency versus the brain disease versus AMN, we can add another color hmm. and then look at the mutations of those patients. Is, there, is this work uh, available or done? I, I don't recall reading a paper like that. Um, Stefan, you want to comment? I mean, this is regarding the um, adrenal insufficiency Relationship like, to phenotype? I don't think yeah, there phenotype is. Phenotype for all the no. mutations of ALD patients that we have in the different databases, cohorts, yeah. and in terms of the timing, and it might help us. So com so complicated question, in part because it's it's hard to do that uh, retrospectively, and 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 you know the latent adrenal insufficiency versus the manifest uh, station of symptoms and. So on and so forth. But I, I think we can model this for starters. And I would, Stephanie, we would like to be part of your group that's looking at sex specific changes in relationship to some of the diseases we're, we're looking at. So I think that would be a nice place to start asking questions and going after low hanging fruit. So, um, so that, that would be great. Nikhil? Um, thanks also from my side. It was a really nice talk. I enjoyed it. Um, I, I guess this is just an open question because I've read this in a couple of papers that um, the cells of Leydig are also highly affected in patients with ALD, that there's loss of uh, cell death. And I was wondering if anyone was looking at testosterone levels or sort of the, again, back to the HP, HP yeah, uh, testosterone, uh, sort of, yeah, looking at different changes in testosterone levels because of effects on cells of Leydig in ALD patients. Yeah, so um, um, while I don't know that literature as closely as some of the brain forms, I think we do know, and there is literature to show some suppression of testosterone and the appropriate elevation of those pituitary hormones. So if the Leydig cells are not functioning well, whether for whatever reason, whether it's a toxic accumulation of degradation products or a long chain fatty acid, uh, pathomechanism, whatever's causing that, um, that state, the brain, the pituitary gland, sees that the Leydig cells are not functioning well and appropriately raises its hormones to knock on the door. Come on, Leydig cell, let's make some testosterone. So you have very specific neuroendocrine signatures for a hypogonadism that may be ALD directed or pathomechanistically versus some of these other disorders that I talked about this morning where the problem is the brain's not doing the signaling. So you have the low testosterone and low gonadotropins because the problem's up here, not down here. And those are important clues. I, I present them as two completely different signatures, but occasionally you see patients that have tripartite levels. You know, the world is not always so black and white as much as we like these compartmentalizations because at least they help us in our daily work to have some scaffolding to figure these things out. But we know there are conditions where you may have multiple layers that are affected. Or if a child with a brain issue has cryptorchidism, even though the testes can come down later in life, 
that already puts a little bit of burden on that testicular tissue. It's not 100% normal. So those are situations where you might actually have really brain and gonadal combination defects. So all of this requires careful sorting, careful patient study to do the best that we can to bin when we need to bin and then to aggregate when there are larger thematic messages that will push us forward. Yeah. So, so, so also to answer from the clinical ALD side, so we, we see uh, um, um, fertility issues in, 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 in men on occasion, and there are some there are reports in in um, uh, in, in the literature, and, and we've also found everything that Stephanie just said, including uh, um, inflammation that uh, in, in in sperm that might be secondary to very long chain fatty acid accumulation. Interestingly, if you look at the mouse model of ALD. Uh, there is ne neither adrenal insufficiency nor nor a, f a failure of the lytic cells and for no fertility issues. Uh, so so, but there is this obesity phen phenotype. I think that that's that's important. Like and no cerebral disease. And no no, no cerebral <laughs> disease. But I, I'm just sort of that's taking the default. I mean that that we clearly know is is beyond uh, the at least until Kendrick tells us otherwise. Mm -hmm. There's. Uh, it, it uh, diverges within monozygotic twins, so I'm putting that off the genetic table. <laughs> Good, we've come a long way. I think we're going to have Kendrick and Rachel lead us into a final session. Uh, um, but uh, applause for. <laughs> the